This is Josh Hoff, JTH Boxing today. I'm here I'm in London and I'm joined by Nottingham and MMA legend Dan Hardy. Dan, first of all, how are we doing today, my friend? Really good, my friend, really good. Good to be back here again. Another big press conference and Garner's getting another boxing opportunity. It's good to be here. Let's just dive straight into it, obviously. It's massive what's happening here again. AJ's back out, a very active AJ at the moment as well, fighting Ngarnu who originally when he first got announced in the boxing world wasn't taken very seriously and now people are saying he's a genuine threat in the heavyweight division. Just how exciting is this fight in the grand scheme of things? I'm, I'm very excited for this for a couple of different reasons. First of all, because of the performance that he put on against Fury. Like if I, if I was picking a person for him to fight in his first boxing match, I would have rather him faced AJ to be honest because AJ's not got the same kind of level of trickery that uh, Fury's got. You know, he's not the same kind of he's not got that same kind of fight IQ where he can set traps and draw people in and you know and really punish them. For me, AJ's good because he's got good basics, good boxing fundamentals. He's able to put his punches where he wants them with good speed and precision. And, and I think it's a far more straightforward fight than the Fury one is. You know, for me, this is a better matchup for Ngannou. I feel like the performance that he gave against Fury is the reason why he's got this opportunity. But if you look at this from the Anthony Joshua camp, they're looking at Ngannou as, well, if we beat this guy better than Fury did, then that's a big fight and a big statement, a big win. Lots of eyes, lots of money, etc., etc. Might not be that simple though, right? Because only one person gets to fight Ngannou on the night. And if Anthony Joshua starts to get clubbed around the head with those big punches, his psychology might not hold together in the same way that Fury did. It's a much better matchup, I think. Okay, so we'll refilm this a little bit here. Um, so we'll go back to talking about AJ. Um, obviously, we've just seen him come off a great win against Otto Ball, and it was his third fight of the year. By the time this fight comes out, it'll be his fourth fight in 11 months. Do you feel the activity for AJ has been a real key in seeing this rebuild that we've seen him in this almost new chapter of his career? Yeah, I do, I do. The one person that comes to mind is Cowboy Cerrone, you know, someone that's familiar to all, all MMA fans. He, he was desperate to be fighting regularly because he didn't have those big gaps in between the fights to deal with the psychological up and down and the stress of getting back into a training camp and stuff. I feel like, especially for, for Joshua, in this process of rebuilding, the, the activity and the frequency is much better because he, once he's in shape, stay in shape. When you're coming off a win, follow that momentum into the next training camp and keep it going. I don't know whether this one will feel different to him, but the fact that he's on a good win streak now is certainly going to help him psychologically. But this is just a different fight entirely to anything else that he could fight in boxing right now. It's a far bigger risk and a far bigger mystery than anything else he could face. And if AJ is to put on another dominant performance like we've just seen him, do you reckon that leaves a massive statement and almost a big opening to say, listen Fury, look what AJ's done. He's dealt with these two guys that you struggled with easily. Do you, you got, you've got to take this fight if you want to prove you're the best heavyweight. Do you feel like we could possibly see Joshua versus Fury with a dominant performance from AJ come March 8? That's, that's exactly what I'm expecting. Like, Eddie Hearn and the team, they know what they're doing. That's exactly what they're trying to do here. Due to Ngannou, what Fury didn't and wasn't able to do and make that argument that you're the guy to fight him. I, I think it's a, a very, very smart move. But at the same time, you know, on the downside for Ngannou, he doesn't have that surprise factor, but on the upside, he has that confidence that he's now done 10 rounds with Fury. And how does that change Ngannou? I feel like it could make life a little easier for Joshua because Ngannou might open up a little bit more, but I don't know. It, it's, it's a... It just it sits aside from the heavyweight division, especially for someone like Joshua, because of the risk involved. And obviously, Furan Garnu, it was literally about a year ago, uh, he left the UFC, and people were saying, you know, Dana White said this is probably one of the worst decisions he'll ever make. He won't go into boxing and get a big fight. And regardless of the result in his first fight and the result of this one, he has very much made Dana White look a little bit silly with what he's done. You can only really take your hat off to Ngarnu and say, fair play. He took that risk where no one believed he'd get it, and he's got it, and he has set himself up not just himself but his family for decades to come hasn't he it's, it's amazing really I mean not only to take that risk you know decide that he's going to step out of his contract and into a into free agency not knowing what was on the table and then to obviously sign with the PFL fight Fury then have this opportunity I mean it he, he couldn't have worked out any better for him to be honest I think we're going to see a few more in Garnu fights in boxing and I'm sure that Dana wish he was even, he was involved in those things but like as we've seen from this this uh you know, these recent releases of the class action lawsuit and the, the words they were talking about with John Jones, everything is about control and he was not able they weren't able to control Ngarnu. That's the biggest thing for me. It was he was able to break the control of the UFC and step out and make it pay for him. And do you feel like again obviously regardless of this result against Asia, whether he wins or loses, 
we'll see him in the ring again, especially if he can put on just another good performance. We'll see Ngannou come again and again and again. doesn't matter who it's against, people are going to tune in to watch him now, aren't they? I, I think so. You know, he brings an excitement and a, and a bit of mystery. I mean, of course, that will run out. If he keeps stepping in there against these heavyweights and he keeps picking up losses, then that's going to run out. But the fact that he lost against Fury and he's still in this situation shows that that was a good performance. And I think if he has anything like that performance against, uh, against Joshua, the door stays open for him in the heavyweight boxing world. I want to turn the attention to UFC now quickly as well. See, this weekend we see the undisputed middleweight championship on the line between Sean Strickland and Drickus Duplessis. It's a matchup that if we spoke about these two names a year ago, saying they would fight for the undisputed middleweight title, you would have laughed. But here we are. Um, if I was to ask you for a prediction on how this fight is going to play out and who's going to get their hand raised, what would you have to say? Man, I feel like this is going to be a messy fight, to be honest. I think it's going to be all over the place. But this, for me, is where... Strickland's skill set really could be on show in its best form. Like Duplessis is really good at covering distance. He uses that space bouncing in and out, uses his speed and athleticism well. But Strickland's just going to take that space away from him. So what I'm expecting to see probably at mid-second round is quite a tired Duplessis trying to get away from Strickland. It might look very much like the Abbas Magomedov fight where he just threw everything he could, nothing had an effect on Strickland and then he got wore down. It might not be a very good matchup for Duplessis this one. And Strickland's style, although it is a, it's not necessarily the most aesthetically pleasing, it could be very effective against someone like Duplessis. So are you go for a Sean Strickland victory? I think Sean Strickland's going to do it. And I wouldn't even be surprised if he's able to stop him. You know, he's got, what, three, four rear naked chokes on his record. Last one was his UFC debut. But I could see if Duplessis starts to get tired, starts to collapse against the fence, I wouldn't be surprised if Strickland jumps on him and either finishes him TKO or even takes him back and choke, takes his back and chokes him out. I'm, I'm open to surprises with Sean Strickland because he's won me over this year. And another big fight that we've got coming up as well with UFC 298. We see Volkanovski versus Taporia. Obviously, Volk's coming in of this one off a loss. A lot of people are saying Taporia could be too much to handle. You know, he for me, he is up there as one of the best up-and-coming fighters. For me, I don't think it would be it'd be an upset. Don't get me wrong, if Taporia is to pull it off, but I don't think it'd be a massive upset. Do you think Taporia does have a chance in this fight? I, I think Taporia has got an incredible chance. I, I think, you know, even watching him coming through the early ranks before he joined the UFC, his neck attacks, Dars chokes, anacondas, he's lethal. But if he can't put somebody away with a neck attack, then he's going to put him away with his powerful punches. He's got everything he needs, the Greco to back it up. You know, of course, like Volkanovski is a, is a standout in the featherweight division. But of course, you know, his time is going to run out. And I do feel like we saw a... Uh, you know, a, a less than optimal version of him against Makachev. Of course, it was a short notice fight, but I, I don't know. I mean, these guys are going to catch up with him eventually. It's going to be someone like Ilya Taporia that's got the submissions and the power, as well as the fight IQ to be able to deal with someone like uh, like Volkanovski. I'm a big fan of both of these guys, but it might be a time for a change in the guard, and Taporia might be the guy to do it. And the last fight I want to push you is a matchup that I find really interesting Dustin Poirier versus, is it Bernard Saint Denis? It's a matchup that's kind of come out of nowhere. But St. Denis does come in as, as the favourite as well. It's a very interesting matchup, isn't it? It, it is, especially given the fact that he is a favourite. You, you would think with so many people knowing who Poirier is, the two wins over McGregor, like you would think everyone was going to back uh, Poirier in this one. But the betting odds must have started this way because there's a big fanfare behind uh, Benoit St. Denis. And, and, you know, fair play to him for, you know, for, <laughs> for, for putting himself in this opportunity. This is going to be a massive win for him, biggest win of his career by far. But he's, uh, he's certainly excited the MMA fans to the point where he's going to be coming in as the favourite. And I wonder what that does to Dustin Poirier's mindset, because that must be unusual for him. I think, when you look, I think Poirier might not be too affected by it, because obviously there's been fights like this before, but it's, not, it's that different one. Obviously, you know, he's had the McGregor fights where they're so big and like, people were backing McGregor. But this is one where, on paper, if you were to put these two names to a casual MMA fan, they'd go, oh, Poirier all day, because people have heard of him. So it might be a different approach to this fight, wouldn't it? It might, be, it might be feeling a bit different mentally about seeing this as well. Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, when, for me, whenever Poirier is going into a fight, he's, he's never the he's never the superstar. That's the, the the person that he's fighting has the opportunity to fight. You know, even in the even in the third fight with McGregor, it was a McGregor fight where Poirier was the opponent. That's kind of how it felt from the fans' perspective. And I don't know whether that's the the star power of Dustin Poirier and and kind of maybe it's it's kind of topped out or something, but. I don't know. It, it, this this doesn't feel like a like a Dustin Poirier fight where Benoit Saint Denis got the opportunity to fight him, which really it should do at this stage in Poirier's career, right? He should be the A side of all of these fights, but somehow in this one he's not. And people like the God of War. What can we say? <laughs> Dan, I'm going to let you go now. Thank you very much for your time, and I'm sure we can speak again very soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Very good talk.